Hey, everybody, welcome back. I am Emily Moyer, the, oh, no longer ponytailed Michael Wan. He pulled it down while we were just chatting. The no longer ponytailed Michael Wan is here. This is episode number 30. We are 30 years old, Michael, or 30 episodes old, playing the glass bead game. How you doing? I'm doing well. You got, so we were talking about hair. We were talking about hair in before we started recording and then you just brought it up again and i'm looking at myself because i got the zoom in front of me and i'm seeing myself and i kind of had this imag this this imaginatory experience just come up like i was like what would i look like if literally my head was shaved and like the face was shaved and the eyebrows were shaved and i think i'd be a really strange looking individual like i think that the hair kind of makes me look normal but without it i would be a weird looking person that's just my you, thought you, you would look you, you would actually look like this what let's see there's a, there's a quite kind of a variety of them but actually you would actually kind of look like september so let's look you would look like an observer from fringe Right, so they, they were the people, you know, the, the, right. So this is uh, this is September, who is the most, uh, the, the you know, the, the most pop, the, the the observer that was the most interactive with the, you know, the regular humans throughout the series. But there was I a think that of, dude looks normal though. I think that like I some people look good with like no hair, but I don't think I would be one of those individuals. So there was a few of them that were really weird looking. I'm going to see that they just keep mostly showing. Uh, September because he was the one who interacted the most with the humans, right? But there was one or two of them that had really bizarre or here, look at this one, right? So there he's kind of weird looking. Um, let's see. There's one in particular. Look at this one. All right. Right. Look at that one. There's one in particular I'm thinking of that I'm not. This guy's pretty weird looking, right? So there was just hundreds of these bald headed in business. Yeah, this one is definitely weird. Thank you, Laura. Look at that one. That 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 doesn't uh, strike at the reptilian, uh, <laughs> right? Kind of right, right, right. Vibe. Um, but that's I mean that's the whole thing is they've lost all of their hair. All of the observers have lost any all of their hair. So no eyebrows, no facial hair, no hair on their head, and then these very sort of this pasty looking skin where you can see all of the pores in a very like you know sort of magnified kind of way um it's I, I, like my guess would be like the idea was sort of that this was the midpoint between human and gray right this is like this is the sort of hybridization where they've introduced the technology into the body right and um you know they still like largely look like humans but are taking on some of the characteristics of what the human sort of collective consciousness understands as a gray right and if the progression isn't put to put it put stopped at a certain point then ultimately that the, the gray is in their future right mm. that could be me so yeah <laughs> so because so, so. I, I don't want to make this about me, but now I'm going to make this about make me. Make it about you. It's make always it about more me. fun and interesting when it's about you, Michael. So let's Okay, go. okay, okay. So I'm coming up. I'm coming up. We're, we're, we're in like the final stages, the lead up, like, um, like the, you could hear like the begin, the overture, the overture is beginning. And what the, what, what it's beginning is we're, we're moving into my birthday season. We talked about this a little bit before. And this is going to be a big birthday for me. Do you have any idea how old I'm turning this year? Five yes. zero. Cinquenta. Laura's what did Laura say? Cinquenta, five zero, fifty. So, so like uh, she never she never ceases to surprise me with with her 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 attributes and abilities and and the mathematical uh, accuracy is is now on that list because you're right, Laura. I'm turning fifty, and. 50 in our, in our number system and in our culture, it's a big deal. It's a big deal, right? It's like, oh, it's 50. It's like a big thing. And like, I, and I typically am not a birthday guy. I'm not a birthday guy. Like, I mean, obviously I like birthdays. Like I like to get presents. Right. But like, I'm not one of those people who, um, I'm not one of those people who, uh, 
uh, really, I know people who really get into their birthday and I don't even know, maybe once I had a birthday party since being a child, but I definitely have never like really like had parties. Like it's just never, it's never uh, struck a chord for me. It's not that I'm not social. I love parties. So anyway, so all of this, this is 50. This is my 50th birthday. And I'm thinking like, I'm not, I'm not like, oh, it's a, it's a big deal. But I also recognize that there's a lot that goes on in all of our, our consciousness, which maybe we're not so aware of, you know? And so I'm like, all right, well, maybe I'm one of those people. Maybe I'm one of those people that's not aware of everything that's going on in the back of my mind. And maybe in the back of my mind, maybe in the back of my mind, there is something stirring. I'm like, well, 50 is a big deal, Michael. Michael, it's a big deal. So all that's going on, right? So that's in the backdrop. That would be true for anyone. But this is not. This is not a normal 50th birthday. There's something greater going on. May I show you? Please. All right. All right. All right. So we're going to do a little bit of what I call. Laura's I call trying it, to steal your thunder, but I'm not going to let her. <laughs> Don't you steal my thunder. <laughs> I added like an attribute on the list and I can add in, uh, something into the column of, of, of areas of concern and stealing my thunder <laughs> may just go upon that. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. So I'm going to talk a little bit about objective astrology. Now, where I am with my understanding of astrology, and it changes, and all of our understandings of the things which we look into probably changes as we change. And uh, though I am um, fairly well-versed in astrology, it's changed recently. And, what, and I practice what I call objective astrology. So it is a recognition of there being some sort of significance and value in understanding the placement of the planets uh, at the moment of your birth, but it takes a lot of way from um, the signs, but the, but the planetary placements are still significant. So we're going to go and we're going to look at my chart. So here we go. And I highly recommend this is to me, this is the best free uh, uh, software or web website out there for astrology information. There's lots of good stuff, but Astro Theme, Astro Theme is what, what I like to use. And so here's my chart. Let me go add this right here and I'll add, da, 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 redraw it. And we can see. So, so I'll explain what all this means. So this is what a typical person's chart looks like, you know, the, or how it's displayed. But it, and they look, if someone can read that, only a small percentage of people can even make sense of it. But of those who are able to make sense of it, they don't even realize what they're looking at. It is a literal representation of what the heavens look like at the moment of your birth where you were on earth. And so we have this line right here. This is where all of the astrological charts begin is the ascendant. It's where the 12th house then transitions to the first house. And what it is in material reality is it's the Eastern horizon. And the opposite side right here is known as the descendant. And this is the Western horizon. So if you can imagine yourself for standing right here on the plane of earth, this is your East horizon, this is the West horizon. And then this is what's visible in the sky. All right, this is where all the planets are. And all we see when you look at the signs and the degrees, it's telling you a placement. It is marking a placement. So it's very, very objective. So we're going to go and look right here. So I use tropical, and this works also with sidereal as long as you're consistent. But I'm using tropical right here. And this is where my son was located when I was born. And it was located at 10 degrees Sagittarius. That's a very, very specific part of the heavens. It's I, The sun is located or identified by like stars around it. But I have no idea how you'd be able to see the stars. But nonetheless, nonetheless, that's like the idea behind it. I was born at 7.30 at night, so this is the Western horizon. You can see the sun is beneath the Western horizon, of course, because the sun has already set. So what I'm pointing out is this, this, this 10 degree Sagittarius. So now we want to go and we look right here. Da, 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 da. So the final eclipse for the 2021 eclipse season will occur on Saturday, December the 4th. December the 2nd is my birthday. December the 4th is when this eclipse happens, and it's at 12 degrees Sagittarius. So what this means right here is, so that's two degrees away. So if this is where the sun is, and this is, and this is true for all of us, this is why knowing the placements of your planets. Like if you were looking at sidereal, 
uh, this would call this would say that my son was in in Scorpio, but it doesn't matter. It's this placement, this part of the heavens, whether you call it 10 degrees Sagittarius or you call it 15 degrees Scorpio, it's it's pointing to the same thing. And so this location is important in my connection with with the natural world. And that's true with everyone. You can look at your chart this way and understand the placement subjectively. So that being said, I have my 50th birthday. That in itself, from our cultural sort of programming, is like 50 is important. If we weren't on a base 10 mathematical system, 50 would not have, we wouldn't do it on 50, but we do. So 50 is important. And then on top of it, at the same place, literally what's happening is there's going to be a solar eclipse. And so now I've got a solar eclipse happening on my, um, on my, uh, 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 on my sun location. And I'm just going to go and show this for you. Um, let's see if we, we have this right now, if they're going to show me, this is the current, this is the current, uh, um, placement of the planets right now. And we can see, let me see if it's got the North node and South node. So we could see the North node right now is located at, um, is located at about, uh, two degrees Gemini, which means the South node is completely opposite, which would be two degrees, um, which would be two degrees uh, Scorpio. And so the reason why that's also important is because if you go and you look at that on my chart right around here, this is two degrees Gemini. This is where I have a major, a major, a major opposition. So I've got Saturn right here and opposite right here is Neptune. That's like, if I were to see that in someone else's chart, I'd be like, wow, that's, you know, that's a big deal opposition. But in the same placement is exactly where the nodes are. So I, and, and the nodes move about a degree a week. That's about their, 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 their speed. So what I'm trying to tell you with all of this, with this birthday, which is coming up, not only is it my 50th, but I have an eclipse on my sun and the nodes are on my Saturn Neptunian, my Saturn Neptunian axis. So all that being said, Emily, you know, because I don't know what's going to happen. But if I were to go and look at the indications of what's happening in the heavens and I look at my own life, it's telling me some major changes are afoot. And so that, my friend, is what I've got going on. <laughs> I think Laura has some comments. Well, I think if I'm understanding properly from my teacher, um, Neptune would also be Kazemi in your chart as well. Define Kazemi. Kazemi is when there is a planet that is within uh, 10 to 15 degrees of the sun. Yes. And so that gets more amplified. It's a very, um, it's like that planet is in the heart of the sun. And so all of the attributes and significations of that planet get more um, highlighted and amplified. And it's an actually really sweet spot for that planet. So as you can see, and if I'm going to go and I, by the, on my birthday, Venus will also be, will also be uh, on the, on my node location. So you have like the natal, your natal chart location, then you have like real time location. So all of these things are in place. So it looks like it's a, it's a good thing. I've got three, uh, a whole bunch of planets near the sun. I've got Jupiter, Mercury, and, and Neptune, but you're absolutely right. So again, I told you, I didn't want to make this about me, but what it does occur, a court, what, what, what seemingly being indicated by the, the, uh, the placement and the movements of the mysterious serious uh heavens is that there are there there's there's something afoot there's something afoot there's something afoot all right so what this is making me think about because I, I i you know I, there's a few things that i spend a lot of time thinking about right and, and and i'm trying to like sometimes somebody will present an idea and like for me whether the idea is I don't want to say valid or not, because there's plenty of ideas that are valid that I don't look at that never come across my plate that aren't that interesting to me that may be completely true and valid and better than anything I am attracted to, right? But I, when something appeals to me and how I decide that like I'm going to kind of include it in my own personal running narrative or story or whatever is like, how, cause it, how can it make sense to me in my lived experience? And also, can I go out there now and like play with it, right? Can I, can I go test it in any kind of way, 
right? And so obviously based on lots of shows I've done with you and on my own and with other people, you know, this stuff that we've been playing with the glass bead game and the synchronicities and all that kind of stuff is, is important to that process. But the thing that has really been help, like helping to give me some structure and all of that has definitely been the FPV angel material, right? And so okay. I'm trying to understand how that operates, like how that, how can I go and like apply the things that I've learned from them to like something that I can do my, by myself or something I can do on my own and figure out like the mechanics of how it really works in my own life right? Like how, what, what that means. And so I've been trying to, since I've got, since I've been here, figure out where the particle accelerator is, right? Or where the particle accelerators might be around here, right? And I think I'm on to, I think I'm on to something, right? All right. And, and, I, and if it's not, if it isn't the particle accelerator, there's something, you know, there's something energetic going on in this, in this space that I'm going to talk about. But when you were, when, when, when I was looking at your chart and looking at all the little symbols and just looking what the chart looks like, it does look like a circular particle accelerator, right? It does look but the, the, right. So think about this. Now, what FPV angel, what they say is that what is happening underground is reflected in the heavens or reflected in the sky, right? So the clock, the thing that is actually the hardware of what we think of as the clock in the sky could be under the ground, right? And there mm -hmm. was one picture in there, like if you bring, bring back up your chart, bring if you can bring back up that chart that we were just looking at, right? Like there over here, okay, so next to what I think is, uh, wherever this one is, it looks like the little devil's pitchfork over here with the upside down cross, whichever one. That, that one? Is. Yeah. That's Neptune. Okay, right next to it is something that looks like the Templar's Cross. That's the vertex point. That's one of the 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 most significant play uh, axes in someone's chart. And you have the vertex and the anti-vertex, okay, which is completely were, opposite. If you were to draw a circle around that, you would now have a symbol that they use a lot in their work, that Carl Jung uses a lot in his work, that looks a lot like Walter Russell machine, Walter Russell's machine, right? And also would look like if you imagined the earth either as a sphere, whether that sphere be like a land sphere or a toroidal sphere, or if you did it flat, it could be flat, but a circle, right? And you imagine that earth had these, these metal rods or posts in it that were part of the overall machine, right? And then what we all, what we know is that anything alive like fractalizes itself, right? And so then you would have like, if this were the whole earth, right? If that were a, a depiction of the whole earth with the big components of the machine in it, then like that big earth would be make up, made up of lots of smaller versions. Like when you look at the, uh, you know, have you ever looked at like Mandelbrot sets or fractals or mm -hmm. even if you go look at like um, the cauliflower at the grocery store or whatever it is, you see this everywhere. And so then there are smaller versions of these everywhere, right? Okay, so. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the things that I look at. And so if we're looking at this, this could be a depiction of the machine under the ground, right? That is creating the sky clock. And it's, so the machine isn't in the sky, it's in the ground, but it reflects in the sky, reflects back to us, right? Okay, so I've been trying to figure out where in Austin the particle accelerator or the particle accelerators or the components of the local parts of the machine are. And I think I'm starting to get onto it in a different way that I didn't understand before. Okay. And this, this sort of, you know, initially I thought, okay, where the power plants are, right? There's weird, it's weird. There's a power plant on each side, uh, on two different points downtown off of the lake. Either there are smaller ones there, sort of in the little bay out here in front of Oracle, and then on the other side in the little bay over there, sort of in front of where. Um, you know, the Google building and Elon Musk's play stuff is over there. Like maybe there was small components or whatever, or there were two separate ones, but it was kind of marked by those places. And I'm not necessarily not thinking that anymore, but based on a series of conversations that I had with Nish, I started to become um, aware of the importance of the color violet. Right, we think a lot about purple in relationship to it's the marriage of the red and the blue or the royalty.
But when she and I were having some conversations about elders, eternals, vampires, things like this, for some reason, this idea of violet and ultraviolet kept coming up. And one thing that I have noticed since being back here in Austin this time that I never was aware of in all the years I lived here before is that Austin is also referred to as the violet crown. I had never heard of that before. Okay. Well, how did it get that, 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 that nickname? There's this violet or purplish tone in the sky at sunset, right? That, and what's interesting is it sort of, you can see it over on one side of the lake where I, where one, and then you can see it over on the other side, right? And so there's a street right here that literally one of the streets in the Oracle compound is called Violet Crown Road. Okay. And then on the other side of the lake, over on the west side of Austin, there's a trail called Violet Crown Trail. There's also a Violet Crown Social Club, <coughs> a Violet Crown tar Tattoo Parlor, a Violet Crown, like super high end movie theater, right? Like, this is not some term that I, I always knew. I like, I didn't understand before that Austin used to be called Waterloo City, but since I first moved here in 1999, there's Waterloo Records, there's Waterloo Ice House. That's always been a reference I'd heard of. So when I found out that used to be Austin's name, I didn't, that wasn't surprising to me. Right. But I had never heard this Violet Crown thing before. And it is literally the street that runs like right through where we looked at that parking garage that you couldn't get into and stuff like that. There's Violet Crown Trail. Right. Okay. So this violet thing is this effect that comes to the sky around Austin, just around the downtown sort of area here at, at, at dusk. And I've been taking some fantastic pictures of it. This is when I get the best pictures of what looks like there's like a reality up here and then in a complete inverse reality down below with the perfect reflection, right? So, so this idea of violet came up with these conversations with Nish. So I started to really focus in on this, like, what is this? Right, we, she, she, and we in the conversation were sort of connecting it to people who uh, really live a long time, like whether they be eternal or whether they be vampire or immortal or whatever, right? And I'm curious as to this effect in the sky around here being from the fact that the particle accelerator is is doing something because it's in this certain ring that's at a certain height all the time. Right. Right. And it's there on nights that there's no chemtrails. It's there on nights that there's chemtrails. It's different every time. Every once in a while, it's not there. But it's it's it, it's kind of an ever present thing. Hence, that's why they've named this, this spot the place. Right. One block over from it, there's a street called Tin and Ford. OK. And Nish and I had been sort of relating some of this to a book by um, Tracy, one of Tracy, one of the books Tracy Twineland did with someone else. His name is Nicholas Devere. Devere's. He's written an interesting book. I that the, actually, let's see if I can pull up the um, Nick. De, I think it's Devere's. I don't know if I have this right. Let me see if I can find his Nick Nick Devere Nick Devere book. Let me put this book right here. So look at this. Let me share with you, and you'll notice that the symbol on his book looks almost exactly like that symbol right here. Mm -hmm. And it's the dragon legacy, right? So he, he does a lot of stuff with the dragons. Last week, we were talking about the plasma dragons, right? These effects in the ground uh, being part of the, you know, when the plasma sort of events happen, maybe this is areas where there's some vibration from the machine, it creates this effect, right? But when I looked up what Tin in Ford was, I couldn't find anything. It just keeps talking, saying this is a street in Austin, but I'm like, what is a Tin in Ford? Who is Tin in Ford? But when I looked farther, in Persian mythology or Persian, his, you know, ancient stuff, Tinin is the dragon, right? So we have this dragon right here where we have the violet crown. Now I want to show you, let me see if I can find the map of the running trail around. Okay, what is? Oh, the violet crown is generally thought to refer to the atmospheric phenomenon more commonly known as the belt of Venus. Right. The phrase is also said to be connected to the moonlight towers of Austin. I'm not sure what that is. I need to go looking into that. Okay. So there's two cities. What's oh, the belt two, of Venus? There's two cities that are considered violet crowns. Do you know what the other one is? Uh no, I do not. Athens, Greece. Athens, Greece. Okay, so that's kind of interesting right there. 
way back here when they started calling. They started calling Austin the uh, Violet Crown in 1890. But for some reason, it's being highlighted now in a way that it wasn't being highlighted 20 plus years ago when I lived here, right? Because I lived in the same area and I was unaware that there was this focus on Austin as a Violet Crown. Okay. So Austin is also known as Athens of the South, which is interesting because one would think that Athens, Georgia would be thought of as Athens of the South, right? But apparently Austin is thought of as Athens of the South. Of the South. I'm gonna see if I can find map of trail around Lady Bird Lake. All right. So, you know, I've been, all this stuff has been in my mind, you know, like in the back of my mind, it's always there. Let me see if I can find what I'm looking for here for you, with you. All right. So this is, this is a, this is a map of the, the, what it's really a river, but they call the lake downtown, right? So this is Lady Bird Lake. Lady Bird Lake used to be called Town Lake when I first moved here. It was renamed at some point. I'm not sure what year it was renamed. Okay, but basically the trail, the running trail, this is the trail that I, that I do. And depending on how much time and how my back is feeling, how much of the lake I run every day is, is you know, up for grabs. But if you look at this, if you do the whole lake, right? So this is over here. This is Mopac right here or Barton Skyway. And then this is Pleasant Valley over here, which I've talked about several times. That's where they call the cat cult stuff is. So here's Oracle over here. Right. And here is the other power plants that I sometimes talk of is right here. Right. But the trail actually goes all the way over here. And the other violet crown is here. So the violet crown I'm talking about is here. And the violet crown trail that is a hiking trail is over here. What I'm starting to think is that this running trail on top of the ground, underneath it, there's the machine or there's some kind of particle accelerator underneath it. And when people are walking or running over this on a daily basis, remember people make a circle around this every day and whether they be walking or running, right? Like it feels different every day. Some day the ground feels really alive and vibrant and whatever. And other days it feels very still or whatever, but people are either contributing their energy to this process or they're having their energy amplified by this process. And the same phenomenon, you see the same purple thing in the sky on this side and on this side over here. You don't see it so much back here or up here. I'm not going to say you don't see it at all, but where you really see where I get the amazing pictures are always this end or this end over here and the way that they then reflect in the water, right? And so, you know, we have power plants around this, you know, all of the, um, you know, all of the corporate stuff that's going on in Austin is going on really in this zone right around the center portion of it right and this is also where you get the most amount of people walking it, right um, and what's also interesting is you have Austin City Limits the festival that takes place right here right you've heard of the music festival Austin City Limits I've and heard of you it have South by Southwest which takes place more on this side Right, it, it, a lot more events over on this side, Austin city limits over here. One is in the spring, the other is in the fall. Right, and so I'm wondering if, like, when I'm doing, like, when I, you know, when I'm doing my circles, you know, I'm doing my exercise, I go different directions each day. Some days I run to here, some days I do the whole thing, or whatever. It's kind of like the procession of the equinox or the procession of the sky clock or whatever. It's like a small ritual every day that's doing some of this energy. And you have different, like the culture in each different part along this is very different. Like there's like five or 10 different sort of area cultures around this sort of lake. And it's almost like the different signs and symbols, right? Um, but what's fascinating about this, particularly on this side of the lake, is in the areas where it extends out over the water, it's these like floating cement trails on all of these metal posts. And that's the area where you sometimes get some really interesting sensations. Like you can really feel some days you can feel it moving and other days you can't. And it doesn't necessarily seem to correlate to how many people are on it or not. It seems to correlate to something else. Right. And then there's areas where there's bridges where it's like a lot of metal and whatnot. But some of the spots, like there are certain areas where they have these installations 
that look like they're for another reason than what they're being presented to people as, where there's a lot of metal, right? There's a lot of metal and it seems like there could be some sort of interactive technology sort of thing going on. And I'm wondering if part of the reason that Austin has got so much energy coming into it right now, right, is because we are in a cycle of where this has been activated, right? And, you know, and it's not that they maybe maybe they figured out how to turn it on, or maybe it's just they knew that this was the time period when this was going to be highly activated, right? But it seems to have happened before. Like Austin has had periods of time where significant things happen, and then it seems to recess and 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 rise and fall and whatever. But what I'm wondering, based on the phenomenon that I see in the sky, right? Because it seems to be localized around this area, right? And it's incredible. I mean, I, I've shown some of the pictures before. I took a lot of pictures yesterday. Maybe if we take a quick potty break at some point, I'll send some of the pictures to the computer so I can show you sort of these effects that I'm talking about. But I'm wondering if this violet crown, this violet ring around the sky is the sign in the heaven, but it's pretty low to the ground, right? Like this isn't the big machine that is the whole earth. This is the localized version. And you can tell by this effect. And maybe the reason I wasn't familiar with this term before, or even I, I hadn't noticed this in the sky, granted my, my focus was on way different things back in 1999 and 2000 than it is now, right? But maybe it's not always present. Maybe this is something that comes in cycles and phases, right? And then the city is sort of more referred to that way, you know, or, or it's focused on and other, other times it's not, right? But based on this that I'm starting to notice in this I mean, so over here we have the violet crown and then right next to it, we have the dragon, right? Like think about what we see in crests of royalty or family shields and symbols. We often see crowns, we often see dragons, right? We see lions, we see like winged serpent kind of things or griffins or, you know, whatnot, right? So you have both of those things referenced here as well the street Waterloo City right, or Waterloo, which Waterloo is thought of as a great battle point, right, Napoleon met his Waterloo kind of thing, so, you know, I don't spend as much time over here now, when I lived here many years ago, I did spend more time over here, this one is farther from where I live, so I don't do this end all the time, right, I always do this end, and sometimes I go, you know, I, I always do about this portion of the, of the run, you know, and when I have a lot of time or I'm feeling really good, I do the whole thing. But this is a very curious area over here as well. Um, so what do you think about, I mean, I, can, I need to flesh this out more, but what do you think about this basic idea that I'm sort of laying down? Where I showed you before, some of that interesting stuff when we were, Misaki was with us was like right here, right? And then of course, across here downtown is where like all the corporations are, right? Mostly like they're in this general zone. Um, but what do you think about what I'm sort of laying out here? About Austin being one of the, like the, 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 the earth, the land, which we think of as Austin as being the location on top of like one of these key particle accelerators and, yeah. and the, the purple skies is an indication. Um, there, so I'm not as familiar with with the uh, the FTP angels. FPV, FPV, FPV. I need to write it down. So that, that's it. that's the like that's one of the guys, and he, all the stuff is on the channel. He does most of the graphics. They refer right. to themselves as APM research, so angel particle. Right, research right, research. right. Yeah. So I'm not that familiar with it, but what I do, what 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 makes a lot of sense so i'm i'm familiar with that as an idea and i like to hold on to it just like that like i uh that's not that hasn't pulled me in to go deep on that yet but but i'm aware that it's an idea um but what does pull into my mind is the significance of austin in the technosphere like you know all the companies moving there and all of that sort of stuff and then and then also the the cultural influence with its music festivals and that sort of stuff so i'm like okay there's something going on right there and then to tie that into then all of your personal experiences so um just on that level like i think there's 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 something there's something you know worthy of going deeper 
but where I'm intrigued. So a couple of things popped in my mind and I'm not going to go down the first one. I'm just going to throw it out there. It's like, as you were talking about Austin and the, the power plants, I was, you know, I was like Austin powers. I'm like, because ah. you know, that, that whole sort of thing. I'm like, well, what is that? And like that, that I don't, that's a whole different thing, but, but it's see, it's seemingly connected Austin powers because when you begin to look at what is being introduced in those movies and then who Mike Myers is and all the different players there, there's some, there's some meat on that bone. Uh, but where I want to focus right now and where what, what I think of your idea or where it's pulling me, uh, I'm going to first ask a question for further definition before I, before I show my cards. And that is, what do, what do you think a dragon is? Like when, like when we talk about all the dragons, like what's a dragon? Like is a dragon like a symbol of something else? Are there actual physical dragons at another time? Like how do you... How do you um, define I, that in your mind I, I think it's a, i think it's an energy i think i think the plasma dragon is probably like the closest i think it's like an energy that brings a, a tremendous amount of like uh force heat um you know like i mean i think of the you know fire breathing dragon but i don't think that there was actually like some creature flying around in the sky I think it's like this just all consuming, powerful, forceful energy that can come and sort of literally change the makeup of a place, you know, in a very short period of time. Right, right. And change everything with its force, with its energy, with its power. Right, right. With its activation. Right. For what, I, for what it's worth, I think it's both. Or at least I'm yeah. open to the idea because uh, my thought is um, there are so many universal symbols from different cultures at different times talking about the dragon and the whole sort of dinosaur story is kind of ridiculous i'm like maybe there really were dragons maybe there still are dragons but nonetheless like i like that but i do think you're also right like the dragon then refers to to has been used as a symbol but nonetheless the dragon is what has me interested um because let me go show you this i don't know if you you saw this yourself yet um, so I went and I was looking at like the, did, did I do? No, I didn't. I just, did I do share screen? I stopped sharing so you can share. Okay, there we go. Um, so I was looking at, I was looking at this whole city of the crap of the violet crown. And that certainly intrigues me um, for a variety of reasons. And, and sure enough, you know, we see Athens, Greece and, and Austin, Texas. And yeah, you brought up Athens, Georgia, but all, um, just the words, the, like, like the, the cadence and, and kind and the, 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 how they're structured, Austin and Athens have more similar in common than less in common, just phonetically speaking, but nonetheless, it says here that we get Athens is uh, its its name as the the violet crown through the lyric poet Pindar. Pindar. And so, what's Pindar? It's the dragon. So no, well, it's the it's the dragon's penis. Yeah, <laughs> it's the dragon's penis. And if you want to go down like the whole sort of. Um, like this is the deep state mapping project. Are you familiar with all of these posters this guy puts out? I think his name is Dylan, maybe? It begins oh, with a D. Oh, that's amazing. So, <laughs> oh, he, if you're not familiar with his stuff, you gotta go uh, You gotta go look into it. And he was like really, really involved back in the QAnon stuff. But nonetheless, I his research is great and he's got all these great maps. And this map here is, uh, what is this one of? So this is, it connects all of these different things, the CIA and military industrial complex and Freemasonry and Zoroasticism and the Inquisition. And in the center of it all is Pindar in the ah. center triangle. It's the peak of the triangle above the Council of the 13, above the Committee of 300 banks, yeah. think, think tanks. And so it is from... Um, you know, I've always been intrigued by that idea. There's never really much spoken. Like, what the hell is this Pindar? Right. Uh, yeah. And, and I've yeah. looked into a little bit. It doesn't go that deep. But nonetheless, what strikes me uh, as so interesting is like, OK, now we're talking about Athens, like this connection of this purple, this purple crown for whatever. You know, it's a it's a it's a an object. 
it's a seemingly physical sort of attribute. You can see it with your eyes. And we know that there's a link to Athens. I'm, I, I'm assuming that Athens probably, maybe they see the purple there. I don't know. But nonetheless, it's connected by, or it's, it's grounded Athens. The first crown, uh, violet crown city is through this Pindar character whose name means uh, both like, you know, the, the penis of the dragon, but then the penis of the dragon is also like the, the epicenter of the, the, the bad guys who are doing this whole thing. And you're talking about the dragon aspect. That's why it's like, how do you define the dragon? Like, I don't know what it is, but apparently this Pindar and this, this violet, this violet crown is rather significant. And we'll also, I'll go throw this in before I stop is uh, purple. Um, purple has been tied to royalty. The royalty wears, purple. you know, there's all these different why, you know, the bloodline and all of this, but for a, a more, uh, you know, practical uh, historical reason, you know, that narrative, I don't know if it's true or not, but I know that this narrative has been put out there, is the uh, royalty uh, used to wear purple, and they used to wear a very specific type of purple. It was known as Tyrian purple, T-Y-R-I-A-N. And it comes from Tyre. And this is back in, like, I don't know, like a long time ago. But Tyre was this one seaport along the Mediterranean where they made a dye out of a certain type of mollusk, which was only found there. And they had this special technique. And it was incredibly, uh, incredibly um, time consumptive in order to make this dye. And because it was so time consumptive, it was a, or a time consumptive. It was a very, very expensive and only royal was able to wear it and so that's kind of where we get that and with the ermine fur the black and white like this all comes back from tyre who is tyre tyre is the phoenicians where does freemasonry begin tire so it's like now we also have this kind of like violet purple connection to all of the all of these different sort of all of these different sort of like uh uh major points of power in the past are tied to these colors, tied to these words, tied to these symbols. And we're seeing it now, as you've just indicated, to Austin itself. And it's beyond just like Austin saying, oh, well, Austin's the purple city or the violet city. And look, and we see it. We're actually seeing all of the major technology companies which are creating the next level of false reality experience for humanity. They're all packing up ship off of off of like, you know, the 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 coast of California and they're moving there. So, you know, the law, the short answer or the short summary to your your simple question is like, yeah, I think there's something there. I think there's something very interesting there. All right, check this out, right? You, but this, this, you, this, this shit is never a mistake that I even picked this map. So here's the capital. It's the fucking shape of a penis. Oh, yeah. Look at this. And so this is Congress. Look at this. This is exactly. And Congress means sex. I mean, that's the definition of Congress is like right. you're so you're okay. Together. You're coming together, right? Okay, so. You've done well. 